Father, part of the joy of being a follower of Jesus is that we are confident in his promises. And we're going to look at one of them this morning, and that's the promise to return. Jesus is, in fact, coming again. That promise is the subject of our discussion in John 14. We know that the world sometimes mocks us for believing in the imminent return of Christ. Some think that we're crazy for looking for a returning Messiah. And that's not new. They thought the believers in Peter's day were crazy too. But with Peter, we have placed our faith and our trust in him, knowing that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. He has never let us down, and we believe he will return, perhaps today. We're thankful also, Father, for the privilege that we have to pray for one another. And we think of our partners in ministry, for Ryan and Amparo Pennington, who are headed to Southeast Asia to put the word of God into the language of a people who have never had it before. And we're grateful that we can partner with folks who are expanding the reach of God's word. We also pray for Steve and Joanne Carter, their days of active missionary service have passed, and yet they are still involved in serving the Lord in their church and would ask that you administer to them as well down in Arizona. We think also of our partners in ministry up at Calvary Community Baptist Church in North Glen. The church has a place in our hearts because our family spent a dozen years up there. And we pray for Pastor Redlin and for his wife Barbara and would ask that you administer to them and through them in their service today. We also think of Zach and Shauna Killiman. We're grateful that they are serving the Lord right now, but also looking at how they can serve the Lord in the future. We ask that you would guide their steps. We also thank you, Father, for those who serve us in the civic arena. We pray for our Congressman Doug Lamborn. I would ask that you would give him wisdom and for our state representative, Scott Bottoms, both of these men profess Christ as Savior, and we're grateful for that. They, these are ones who represent us, and we're grateful for that fact. would ask that you administer to them and that you administer through them to us, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life and be able to share Christ. Pray for our mayor, John Southers, in these last days of his term in office, and also for our city and county first responders, Every now and then, Father, we are reminded of the work that they do and the danger that they are put in on a daily basis. And we would ask that you administer to them. Pray for our city council, in particular, council persons Bill Murray and Michael Malley, for our county commission, and for our commissioner, Kerry Geithner. And Father, thinking of the mayor and the, the uh, city council and the county commission, there are elections coming up and people are running for offices, and we would pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom as we vote and that you would place the people of your choosing in these positions. And now, Father, encourage us in the sure hope of Jesus' any moment return. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 14. For those of you who are guests at our church, we've been working our way through the book of John. We finished chapter 13 last week, and we are starting chapter 14 this morning. We're not going to take a large chunk. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3 in a message entitled, In My Father's House. And the thing that I want you to take home with you this morning is that our Savior has a wonderful future in store for us. What does the future hold? Prophecy is a hot topic. It's been a hot topic for decades. As a matter of fact, it's been a hot topic for centuries. People want to know what's coming. In the Old Testament, as God's people came into the promised land, they were warned not to look for knowledge of the future in the wrong places because that would get them in trouble. And you can see that, and we won't turn there, but you can see that in Deuteronomy chapter 18. 
in verses 9 to 14. We watched one of the kings of Israel get himself in that kind of trouble. In 1 Samuel 28, Saul had lost his relationship with the living God. And he's begging for information. What do I do about this coming battle against the Philistines? And God was quiet and Samuel said, or Saul said, all right, then I need to seek out a medium. I need to know what's going to happen in tomorrow's battle. And he found out what was going to happen in tomorrow's battle, that he was going to die. You know, this is not in my notes, but there was a there was a television program not too long ago, and it had to do with tomorrow's newspaper. Anybody remember that? What was the name of that thing? Nobody remembers that. Anyway, it, early edition, that was it. And uh, it was kind of a fun deal, and, and people really liked that program because you could, you could see this guy knew what was going to happen tomorrow because of this early edition of this newspaper that the cat dragged in. People have long wanted to know the future. Part of the reason that God warned the people in Deuteronomy 18 not to look for it in the wrong places is because the people in Canaan who were living there before Israel came did look for it in the wrong places. You can see that in Deuteronomy 18 in verse 14. It's one of the reasons that God gave for expelling them from the land. How many of you are familiar with Nostradamus? If you go through the grocery checkout and you don't order your food and have them bring it to your car, every now and then you'll see some, some tabloid that's got Nostradamus um, predictions. He was a 16th century illegitimate physician turned prophet. Why do I say illegitimate? Because he never studied medicine. He just practiced it. And then he turned prophet. And he had these cryptic poetic prophecies and he wrote whole books on that were all poetic in prophecies and they caught the imagination of the French people and then some of them appeared to come true and next thing you know he's at the French court and he's reading the horoscopes of the French kids the, the, the king's kids and his fame spread spread all through France and spread through Europe but it didn't just spread in time, or in space, it spread in time. To this day, long after Nostradamus has been dead, some people believe that some of his prophecies will yet come to pass. And they'll point at things that he said and say, see, this is a prophecy of X that happened 100 years after he died. And that came to pass. So they look for his prophecies in the grocery store aisle, and they read them, and they hope that they're going to find the answer to the question, what does the future hold? Well, Nostradamus and fortune tellers and so forth are notoriously wrong on many occasions. But the word of God is always, always right. God, who is not confined by space or time, is 100% accurate accurate when he decides to pull back the curtain and show us something of what is coming. And it's one aspect of his revelation that shows up here in John 14 in these first three verses. If you're a follower of Christ, you have a wonder-filled, joy-filled, beautiful future in store. A future tied to the work of our Savior. This morning we're going to take a peek at just a bit of what that future holds. So you can open your Bibles to John chapter 14, and we're going to take a look at these first three verses. We're going to put them up on the screen for you, and we're going to read them together, and then we'll dive into uh, an exposition of these verses and unpack what Jesus is talking about. All right, so let's read verses 1 through 3 together. Begin. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Verse 1 begins, Let not your heart be troubled. 
The word troubled is the same word used back in chapter 12, verse 27, when Jesus talked about himself being troubled about what was about to happen. And then in chapter 13, verse 21, John says it about Jesus, that he was troubled. Jesus was troubled by what was imminent, what was about to come to pass. He knew what was coming, and it caused him great distress. And then you get to chapter 14, verse 1, and he says, Don't let your heart be troubled. And he's speaking to his disciples because they were also troubled. They were bothered because they did not know what was coming. Jesus was in distress because he knew what was coming. They were in distress because they didn't know what was coming. And that uncertainty was what caused their distress. Why well, isn't it the case with us? In fact, I'll mention this here in just a second, but Jesus said to his disciples way back at the beginning in Matthew chapter 5, stop fretting, Matthew 6 actually, stop fretting about tomorrow. You can't control it. It's there. God's in control, but I'm not. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't even know if I'll get to tomorrow. We could have an accident on the way home. I might be in the presence of the Lord. The rapture could happen. Any number of things could take place, and I wouldn't even get to tomorrow. Why am I worrying about tomorrow? But we tend to do that, and that's what was going on with the disciples. I don't know what's going on. Lord, we don't know what's going on. So what is the background of this worry? We're in, in chapter 13 and verse 33, Jesus told his disciples, where I am going, you cannot come. Now remember, the word disciple means follower. And Jesus told these men who had been with him for three and a half years, basically day and night, people who had committed themselves to him at great personal cost. Remember, Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. And now he's telling them he's going away and you can't follow me any longer. It's almost as if he's saying to them, you can't be my disciples now. And that bothered everybody in the room. In verses 36 and 37 of chapter 13, Peter gives voice to what everyone else was thinking. Lord, where are you going? Where is this place that we can't follow? And why can't I follow you now? We've been your follower. Everybody else dropped away. It's just us in this room. That's where the only ones left. We followed you everywhere, and now you're telling us we can't follow you? Why are you forcing us to drop away too? Something was about to happen that would separate these men from the one person to whom they had given themselves heart and soul for over three years. And it was not clear to them that, that, what that something was or what would happen when Jesus was gone. What's going to happen to us? And that's why they were troubled. I'm sure it showed, it, it certainly showed in their questions. It probably showed on their faces as well. They were worried. And that's typical of us. You know, it's easier to worry than it is to trust. It's not helpful, but it's easier. In that passage I mentioned in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, so if you fret and worry and trust, can you add anything to your stature? My kids used to say, it's too bad I was born into this family. One of them in particular really wanted to play basketball. It's too bad I was born into this family because I'll never hit six feet. They barely hit 5'10". Uh, they didn't get the height for the game. And they couldn't worry over that and add an inch or worry harder and add two inches or worried really hard and get to seven feet. They couldn't do that. Didn't work. Let me tell you, if Jonathan could have done it, he'd have done it. You couldn't put more food on your table simply by worrying. So it's not helpful. Still, worry seems to be our constant companion, even those of us who are followers of Christ. We worry over finances. Don't we? Come on. I don't want you to say amen, but just nod your head. Yeah, I do. 
We worry over health concerns. We worry about what's coming in the mail or what's not coming in the mail. We worry about our kids and we worry about our cars and we worry about our cats, those of us who have them. We worry about what our neighbors and coworkers are, are going to think about whatever. We worry about what the government's going to do next. We worry. If baseball weren't designated the national pastime, I think it would be worry. We have a strong tendency to worry. But Jesus starts this passage by saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Why? Well, the reason's in the, next, in the rest of verse 1. If you believe in God, believe also in me. The antidote for worry, then and now, is trust. But trust has to be properly placed. Scripture warns us repeatedly that there are things we shouldn't trust. We shouldn't trust money. It has a tendency to find a way out of our pockets and into somebody else's. We shouldn't trust in military might. We shouldn't trust in other people. We shouldn't even trust our own understanding. Lean not onto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Those things and those people will let us down eventually every time. Misplaced trust is as bad, maybe even worse. I don't know if it's worse, but it's as bad as worry. So in whom or in what do we place our trust? Jesus said at the end of verse 1, you believe in God. Now that, that phrase is a statement, not a question. He's not asking if they believe in God. He's saying you believe in God. That's, that, that's a statement of his confidence that the disciples believed in the living God. Trust in the Father was a given. These were good, solid Jewish men. They knew God. They grew up on the stories of the Old Testament. They understood who God was and what he had done. From their earliest days, they were followers of the living God. Furthermore, they were following Jesus because they believed in God. So Jesus was revealing the Father's will to them, and they said, yes, that's what we want, because we believe in God. Now, Jesus said, you believe in God, because that's the basis for the next phrase. You believe in God, you should also believe in me. Scholars will take those two phrases, believe in God, believe also in me, and they'll talk about whether they're infinitive or imperative and back and forth and um, whether both are imperative, imperative being a command, infinitive being a statement. And my understanding of this as I look at that is the first one is a statement. You believe in God. And the second one is a command. Then you need to believe in me too. You need to trust me. You can trust the Father. You can trust the Son. Well, why is that the case? Because I and my Father are one. Because he who has seen me, as he's going to tell Philip in just a few verses, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You know what God the Father has done for Israel over the years. You know all that stuff. You can trust him and you can trust me because we are together. I'm one with the Father. I've noticed your trust in the Father, and I want you to trust me too. Here's a great thing about trust. Trust is like light with darkness. Trust overcomes fear and doubt. Trust is what banishes fear and doubt from the room. Trust dissolves worry. These men were facing one of the great tests of their discipleship, and in the short term, they were going to fail. Now, why do I say that? Well, because when Jesus is arrested, how many of them stuck around? Like rats off a sinking ship. They were gone. In the long term, that failure would teach them trust. Because the crucified rabbi was about to become the risen savior. Each of these men would learn to trust Jesus and follow him up to and including the point of death. The fear of persecution was going to be gone. The fear of suffering, of deprivation, none of that would have any impact on them after Jesus came out of that tomb. 
Trust me, Jesus says here at the Last Supper. I know what I'm doing, and I know where I'm going. That brings us to verse 2 and the title of the message. The Father's house is home. In my Father's house. This describes a portion of what's coming. The part that's exciting to us. It reminds us of what we just talked about at the beginning of the message. Our Savior has a wonderful future in store for us. I want you to notice how personal this is at the beginning. In my, my Father's house. It reminds me of Psalm 23. A thousand years prior to this, David penned one of the most personal passages ever recorded in the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. Not the shepherd, my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. It's he and me and he and my and you and me. It's all the way through Psalm 23. It's one of the most personal passages in Scripture and it's one of the reasons why it's so beloved to this day 3,000 years later. And here Jesus said, in my Father's house, it's still personal. It's still family. It's still beloved. One of the hallmarks of Christianity is that we worship a personal God. We're not looking at an impersonal nirvana out there someplace. It's not a set of rules and regulations, although there are imperatives in the New Testament, but that's not what we worship. We worship a personal God, a God who loves us. For God's soul loved, loved, loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a personal God. He, he gives us, he, a God who loves and gives, who calls us by his name, a God of personal pronouns. <laughs> and he goes on and says this, in my father's house are many mansions or dwellings places that our hospitable God has in store for us. King James and New King James use the word mansions. That's probably a little misleading because it gives you the sense that when you get up there, there's going to be all these separated places that are all distinct and you know you kind of get the, the vision of, uh, uh, of a mansion up in the hills someplace that's all by itself surrounded by woods. What it really means is that in my father's house, in this mansion that is my father's house are many places for me to dwell for us to dwell so they aren't likely separate houses but rather places within the father's house but make no mistake this is not going to be some squalid rundown apartment someplace you will never live in a better place on earth than the one that God has in store for you in heaven huh, huh. I don't care how nice it is here. We have a home. And this world isn't it. When I was a kid, we sang this chorus all the time. I don't know if anybody sings it anymore or not. I know that they sing it at the old folks' home when I go over there. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Uh, the middle phrase of verse 2 is interesting. It says, if it were not so, I would have told you. It's almost a cross my heart, would I lie to you moment when Jesus is talking here. If what I just told you wasn't the way things are, I would have told you that. If it was different than this, I would have told you. I'm, what I'm telling you is the way it really is. And for discouraged, waffling disciples, they may have needed a little extra encouragement. So Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you like it is. And then he says this at the end of verse 2. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said he was going away. And he says here again, I'm going. But 
I'm going with a purpose in mind. I have a place to prepare for you. He hasn't been just sitting at the Father's right hand for the last 2,000 years. He's been at work for us. We won't take the time to turn to it, but if you turn back to Revelation chapter 21, you would see a description of the New Jerusalem. Walls of jasper. I don't have any jewelry that's jasper. I don't have any jewelry except for this. Gates of pearl. Foundations of precious stones. Streets of transparent gold. How plentiful is gold in the New Jerusalem? You're walking on this stuff. Endless light, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, basking in the presence of God Almighty for the rest of eternity. What a place. I realize that this comparison is not apples to apples, but I like to make it anyway because it just reminds me. Since he left, Jesus has been at work preparing his bride's new home. It took God just six days to create the universe. And Jesus has been working on my house for 2,000 years. What's that place going to look like? Man. Man. Beginning of verse 3 brought the departure of Jesus back to the forefront. He said, and if I go. And you can just feel the blood pressure in the room go up. If I go, oh yeah, you're going. So that was a reason for the disciples' worry. Jesus had to leave in order to do the work the Father had in store for him, but it was a work for us. That departure, remember, would be for the purpose of preparing a home for us. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's why we sang Jesus is coming again. It's not Jesus may come again. I heard some of you as we were singing, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and surely soon. It could be any moment. It could be before we finish this service. It could be before I finish the next sentence. In an instant, the twinkling of an eye, I will come again. That was, they had reason for worry because I was going away. I will come again, and there's the reason for hope. That was his message here in the upper room. That was the message of the angel at the ascension in Acts chapter 111. You men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing into the clouds? This one who went away will come again as you've seen him go. And that was the message that was repeated over and over in the epistles. You could look it up in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 57. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That verse should be on every nursery door. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and on we could go. Over and over, the reason for our hope that Jesus is coming again is repeated by the writers of the New Testament. The world may laugh at us. They may mock us as... as, as uh, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, everything remains the same. You guys are nuts for thinking there's a, a coming Jesus. They may say we're fools because we look for Jesus' return. In fact, some may even say we are dangerous because we look for Jesus' return, and some have. But we look for a coming king with expectancy. I'm just going to read this for you. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not just that he's coming someday, but we're looking for it. Anticipating it. We don't go out and sit on a hillside and stare into the sky. We have work to do until he gets here. We continue to serve the Lord expectantly until the time he comes and says, now, and snatches us away. Jesus is coming again. 
Now, the rest of the verse, I think, reprises that personal touch we talked about just a moment ago. Because he says, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. We are the reason he's coming back. The Lord Jesus will come back first in the clouds to receive us to himself. It's a little uh, second coming primer here. He'll come back at first in the clouds to receive us to himself. And we'll be caught up with him, to be with him. We call that the rapture. So he's coming back the first time to get us, to snatch us away. And later he'll come back to earth to execute judgment and set up his millennial kingdom. And we will accompany him in that return. And we call that the second coming. He'll come back with us. It's the first coming that Jesus is describing here. I will come back and get you. The purpose? That where I am, there you may be also. We will be with Jesus from that time forward for eternity. What was it that was bothering these disciples? Separation. You're going somewhere and you won't let us come with you. And that just bothered them. And Jesus is saying here, I'm coming back and I'm going to get you and we will never be separated again. We will be with each other for eternity. For a bunch of disciples who are going through separation anxiety and were discouraged because Jesus was going away, this was good news indeed. He's saying this to them. Gentlemen, we're about to go through a very difficult time. Remember, this is at the Last Supper. We're going through a very difficult time, but I want you to remember this. I have a wonderful future in store for you. I have something on the other side of what we're about to see that is spectacular. So the story has a happy happy ending. Gethsemane and the trials... The scourging, the crown of thorns, Calvary, all of that was imminent. That was all going to happen within the next 24 to 36 hours. But the cross was not the end of the story. The risen Savior was going back to his father's side, to his father's house, and he has big plans for us. So the story has a happy ending if, if you know Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the story does not have a happy ending. Because there is another destination. And the other destination is eternity separated from Almighty God and from the one who loved you so much that he came and died in your place. There is a different ending. But this this story, the eternity with Christ is without question a happy ending. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore will through the ages be glory for me. When by the gift of his infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place just to be there and to look on his face will through the ages be glory for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promises in your word. We look at a promise like this and here's Jesus speaking to his followers and We recognize that this promise doesn't just apply to those 11 men in the room. It applies to us because we are also disciples of Jesus Christ. We are also followers of our Savior. And the promise that he delivered in that upper room that night is a promise that still stands. And we have a home in heaven. the Savior that's waiting for us. Thank you for revealing that to us.
Paul once said, if in, th if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable, but it's not just in this life. There is a rapture coming. And for those of us who slip into eternity prior to that event, there is a resurrection coming. And we're going to spend eternity in the presence of God. In fact, the very moment of death, absent from the body and present with the Lord. What a joy to know that. I pray, Father, if there's somebody here in the room that does not know Christ, that this would be the day that they say, I, I, I can't turn my heart away from somebody who loved me this much. I can't do it. I want, I want Christ in my life. And I pray that that will be the, the case today. Thank you for our time together in your word. Use it in each of our lives as you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 781. Staying with the theme of being with the Lord, we're going to sing uh, this, this hymn face to face. So I'm going to ask Warren if he'll come and lead us in that. If God has laid a decision on your heart and you want to talk to somebody about it, I'll be down here in front of the communion table. You can come on up and, and talk to me about that. We can pray with you. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, we can open God's Word and show you how you can become a child of God. Because trusting Christ is the gateway to what we just talked about this morning. The home in heaven is for those who know the Savior. And if you don't know Christ, we would love to introduce you to our friend, our Savior, this morning. Let's stand together as we sing number 781. On that first, face to face with Christ my Savior. Our faith is not built on emotions. But I think about what we just talked about and about this passage of Scripture, I get emotional. Because I think about the one who loves me so much that he went through what he's about to go through on Calvary. And even when that was imminent, what he was thinking about was, I'm coming back to get you guys. Huh. Huh. That just stirs my heart. And I hope it does yours as well. And if you're here and you don't know Christ, I just trust that this will be the day that you say, you know what, i, I got to know about this. i got to know about somebody who loved me that much and that would do all these things for me. And we would love to share that with you. We're going to close our service. I'm going to ask uh, John and Anna if they would come on out to the door as well and let you have a chance to greet them and welcome them to our church. Um, we were going to, Jan and I talked about um, having kind of a cake fellowship afterwards. We talked about that last night. We kind of didn't get that done in time. So we're not going to do that. But 
but we do want to just give you a chance to welcome them to our church. And when all the welcomes have petered out, we'll help you carry this stuff to the van. <laughs> uh, in fact, we'll load up our car, too, and help you get it over there. So. And, and with the kids, too. Oh, yes, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Yeah, for, for our pastor's pals, uh, the pastor's pals treasure chest is up here. You guys can come on up and grab one of those things. Thank you. I appreciate you reminding me of that. All right. Um, uh, Warren, if you'll close us with a word of prayer and a song. And we'll be dismissed, but you'll be back tonight. We're going to talk about elevating one another and edifying one another uh, and one other one another. What's the other one? I can't remember. You'll have to come back then and find out. Um, we're going to talk about those one another's tonight in our um, one another series. So hope that you'll be back tonight at 6. All right, Warren. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the message of the hope. Help us to take that hope. And change our hearts and, and make that in the forefront of our lives that we will be sharing that hope with others, especially as we see the world around us changing so much. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with that chorus. Change my heart, O oh God. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh my heart oh.